Hi everyone, welcome back to Useful Genetics. This is Lecture 3C, where we're going to start talking about what it is that proteins do. In this lecture, we're going to talk about the class of proteins called catalytic proteins, or enzymes. Um, flexible molecular machines that stimulate the rate of biochemical reactions. Um, we'll talk in general about how enzymes carry out biochemical reactions. And then we'll talk about a particular example, the enzyme phenylalanine hydroxylase. It's interesting in its own right, but it's also very important because of the phenotype of mutants in humans. Now, I have to start by saying that although most enzymes are proteins, not all enzymes are. So enzymes are complex macromolecular polymers that fold into complex shapes that catalyze specific biochemical reactions, specific chemical reactions. And almost all enzymes are indeed proteins. Here's a typical enzyme on the right, the enzyme glyceraldehyde-3-phosphate dehydrogenase, which plays a very important role in the energy metabolism in our cells. But on the left, is an enzyme that isn't a protein at all. It's a ribozyme, a complex catalytic structure that's made of folded RNA rather than folded protein. We'll say very little about catalytic RNAs in the course, although we should probably mention that most of the catalysis of protein synthesis is done by the RNAs of the ribosome, not the protein. And I wanted you just to know that not all enzymes are proteins, but almost all enzymes are proteins, and they'll, they, by and large, will be what we're talking about in this course. Now, here's the basic features of catalytic proteins. If this is the folded protein here, the protein has a usually a sort of a pocket or a depression in the protein with particular reactive side chain residues exposed in it. This site is capable of binding the molecule, the substrate of the enzyme, the molecule that the enzyme is going to change. And this binding occurs by random thermal motion, but when the substrate encounters this binding pocket, it binds securely to the enzyme. But this binding then changes the chemical environment of the enzyme itself, and that causes the enzyme to change its shape. And it changes its shape in a way that then allows it to cause a chemical change in the substrate, sometimes causing it to react with some other molecules, so that the substrate is converted into a molecule called the product, the product of the catalytic step catalyzed by the enzyme. Once the product is formed, it's a different molecule than the substrate was, and it doesn't bind securely to the enzyme anymore. So the product comes loose of the enzyme, and now that the enzyme is no longer bound to the product, it reverts back to its original shape. So this is a very, very simplified discussion of the key steps in enzyme catalysis. The substrate binds to the catalytic portion of the enzyme. The shape of the enzyme changes. That causes a chemical reaction that converts the substrate into a product. The product disassociates from the enzyme, and the enzyme reverts back to its original shape. Now, here's the complex example I want to go through. This is the enzyme phenylalanine hydroxylase. Here's a diagram of its structure. Here's the phenylalanine that it's reacting with, I think. Um, but we're not going to look at this structure anymore. Instead, we're going to view it in this very schematic form, where we think of the protein as having three parts of the protein. These aren't different subunits. This is all one protein. But part of the protein serves to bring about interactions with other subunits, identical subunits, and the other parts, this is the catalytic domain, and this is a regulatory domain, and I'll mention what they do in a minute. So the interaction domain 
interacts with identical other identical phenylalanine hydroxylase subunits to form a four-part assemblage called a tetramer. This is the catalytically active form. The, the catalytic domains are more active when they're assembled into this structure. What this enzyme does is it converts the molecule phenylalanine into the molecule tyrosine. Both of these molecules are amino acids themselves. They're important components of our diet. Our body has to use a lot of them to make proteins, but it also uses the tyrosine to make other important molecules in the cell. And it can excrete the extra tyrosine that it needs. Now, here's the first time where we're going to think about the consequences. What happens if the enzyme is defective? If there's a mutation in the phenylalanine hydroxylase gene so that the enzyme is defective, it's unable to catalyze this reaction, then not only will the cell not make enough tyrosine, although that's not often a big concern because being sort of carnivore, we get lots of tyrosine, lots of amino acids in our diet, but the cell will not be able to break down phenylalanine. So because we get a lot of it in our diet, phenylalanine will accumulate in the cell and a side reaction takes place. Another enzyme converts phenylalanine into a related molecule called phenylpyruvate. This is bad because phenylpyruvate is toxic. Now, here's the pathway again, drawn smaller. If phenylalanine, phenylpyruvate accumulates in the cells because of a defect in this step here, if phenylalanine hydroxylase is defective, the consequence is that this toxic molecule causes severe mental retardation. So babies with a defect in this enzyme are born healthy because the maternal circulation has been taking care of this reaction. Any excess phenylalanine that the fetus produces passes into the mother's bloodstream and gets broken down into tyrosine and discarded. But once the baby is born, it's cut off from its mother's enzymes. If it doesn't have its own phenylalanine hydroxylase, it's going to start accumulating high levels, and the baby will soon develop severe mental retardation. Luckily, we can treat this. If we know that a baby has a defective phenylalanine hydroxylase gene, the baby can, early in its life, be put on a diet that's low in phenylalanine. So it's a low-protein diet, but particularly a diet that's low in phenylalanine. And babies given such a diet, even though they have a defect in this gene, are able to grow to normal, healthy adults. Now, in Western societies, in anywhere where hospitals, people have access to good medical care, all newborn babies are routinely screened for high phenylalanine in their blood. And this is done within a few days of birth. They're given a couple of days to start accumulating phenylalanine. Now they're away from the mother's circulation. And then their heel is pricked, and a drop of blood is spotted onto a card that's impregnated with chemicals that lets it sense the level of phenylalanine in the blood. If the level is high, the baby's put on a low phenylalanine diet. Now, I'm raising this here, although we won't talk much about it until later in the course. This is phenylalanine hydroxylase mutant alleles, defective alleles, are not terribly common, but there's a wide range in how common they are. Um, in the United States, one baby in 15,000 is born with what's called phenylketonuria, um, high blood phenylalanine because of a defect in the PAH enzyme. In Turkey, it's much higher, also in Ireland, but it's extremely low in Finland, less than one in a hundred thousand. And we'll talk later in the course about the reasons for these differences. But you can see that newborn screening is going to be particularly important in countries where the incidence of the mutation is high. Now, what we've done 
we've talked about the basic structure of catalytic enzymes, that they have a catalytic domain with an active site. The active site then binds the substrate, the molecule that the protein is going to change, and in doing so, changes the shape of the protein in a way that makes it catalyze a change in the substrate, converting it to a product. The product disassociates, the enzyme goes back to its original shape. Catalytic proteins often have regulatory domains. Now, I forgot to say that for phenylalanine hydroxylase, one of the things that the regulatory domain does is that it senses the concentration of phenylalanine in the cell. And if the phenylalanine is starting to get a bit too high, that regulatory domain responds by kicking the enzyme into high gear so it breaks down phenylalanine faster. Of course, this doesn't do any good if the catalytic domain is defective, as is the case in, um, in the mutations that we were describing. We talked about how phenylalanine hydroxylase mutations cause a serious human phenotype, phenylketonuria, and how a simple dietary intervention can change the phenotype from a severe retardation to healthy adults. Coming up next, we're going to go through a few more examples of mutant phenotypes caused by defects in catalytic enzymes. I hope to see you there.